my first question. Uh, but as we go through questions, just let me know where you got it from so we can all refer to the same page. Uh, this one is on a piece of paper <laughs> written, so I don't know where it came from. That's okay though. We have C10H8 solid, and we have the heat of combustion, that's delta H, typically, minus 51, 56 kilojoules per mole, pretty typical units. We want to know the heat capacity, C, of the calorimeter. Uh, is this next part also involved, or is that a new question? Oh, okay. That's also involved. Okay, we also know that there's 1.630 grams of the C10H8, uh, and it's in a bomb calorimeter. It must have been in a bomb calorimeter because it said combustion. Is it, I guess must might be too strong. Most likely it's a bomb calorimeter. So uh, it didn't have to state that. And then it said there's a temperature increase. It's always an increase. If it wasn't, it would be pretty weird in a bomb calorimeter. 8.50. So often, they give you delta T. So how do you set this up to find C? Uh, there's a couple things you'll need to do. But first of all, let's start here. Some of the Qs equal zero. Uh, in a bomb calorimeter, there's always the reaction in the uh, calorimeter. So Q reaction equals minus Q cal, which is minus C delta T. Let's see what we know here. We know delta T, that's the 8.50. We want to know C. Uh, Q reaction, we almost know. We're getting there. Okay? Uh, so, let's see. Uh, because they gave us these numbers, we have to mess with these numbers. I'll show you how. We have minus 5156 uh, kilojoules per mole of, they don't say it explicitly, but this is what they mean. For mole of the thing combusted, the organic combusted. Okay, just like I was explaining in the first part of the review session, change this to grams, and you'll see why in a moment. And then multiply by the grams given. Okay, so far? Okay, take this number, put it right there, then solve. So usually what happens is when they give us this problem, say they say per mole, combusted, I'll give this back to you. Usually what they say is per mole combusted of the item in the calorimeter, and then uh, you actually do this in reverse. But if they give you the mass actual in the calorimeter, you can do, you kind of do both sides uh, like this. This temperature, no, because uh, a temperature difference in Celsius is the same as that in Kelvin. So this is a difference. I've subtracted two Celsius to get this. And if you subtract two Kelvin, it, it doesn't matter. Same same number. OK, let's move on. Yeah. Oh. Yes, uh, everything all check mark. Everything above this line is given. Yeah. Unless the units of temperature on both sides are different, right? You have to convert one to match the R. Uh, do we need to convert this? There's no R, so there's no need to convert it. Well, if it were like a problem where you have two changes. Oh, okay, let me just say something quick about it. Uh, so this is, there's no situation where you need to convert this, because this is a delta T. So for example, let's say it was 108.5 minus... 100. So you get 8.5. Is that okay? In this case. Well, if I added 273 to this and 273 to this, when I subtract them, the 273s will both cancel out. So if I change this to Kelvin and this to Kelvin, the 273s will both cancel. So this is both degrees C and it's 8.5 Kelvin. Because it's a temperature change, it's the same for Celsius and Kelvin. In another example, you don't have a delta T, you'd have just temperature. And so in that case, yes, you'd multiply it, and yes, you'd need to change to uh, Kelvin. 
in that case. If you just add, say, t equals 25, yes, convert that to 298. Definitely, definitely. But if you're having a temperature change, they're the same. Is that kind of okay? Like when we have a solid that we throw up into whatever the volume of water, and then there's a temperature change? Uh, if, oh, if you have a solid, you drop it into water, say there's a temperature change. No, you would not have to convert that because you're going to do a difference. So you're going to go T final minus T initial, and it would be the same, same deal. Okay, who's next? Yes? Would you ever have to do something with limiting reactants? That is still fair game in this class, yeah. Uh, so you may or may not have it. You wouldn't be tested on it explicitly, but there's a number of times actually in the homework that you'll see that I do limiting reactant problems. So still fair game. Yeah? What number? Oh, page 53 in the practice exam reader, this one. Uh, let's see. Let me let me slide over there first. Um, okay, what number? Thirteen. Uh, Thirteen. Uh, this one we haven't covered yet. That's what's called a colligative properties question, and so you'll see that on exam two. This exam was just given later in the quarter, that quarter. Yeah, so don't worry about that one. Okay, next, yes. Spring 2012, number four, is that right? Okay, and uh, this is page three, if you have the reader. Uh, find the enthalpy of formation of NH4Cl. Say you have this, and say it's a solid. You want to find the, uh, the reaction and let's say this has a delta H of formation, whatever that is. You want to find the reaction that forms this. So by definition, let's say this is some number. What's the reaction that comes up with this? And this is a multiple choice question, and so uh, there's a number to select from. Uh, basically, this, the N from elemental form must be N2 gas. H2, or H, the H in here must come from hydrogen in elemental form, and the Cl must come from chlorine in elemental form. So basically what you do is you look through each element, and you write down its elemental form. Okay, That's your first step. Then the reaction would just be the sum of these, N2 gas plus H2 gas plus Cl2, gas, uh, I don't have quite enough room, goes to NH4Cl, solid. Now you balance it. One thing you want to do when you balance it, uh, let's get a different pen color, keep the one right here. Okay, that's one, this has to be one half. Uh, then the H2 must be two, and the Cl must be one half. And that should be answer B in on that multiple choice. Is that all right? Okay, who's next? Yes. And we'll go to you next. Or is it on this? Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll come right to you. Yes. Uh, then if this wasn't a one here, is what you're asking, uh, this would be wrong by definition because the enthalpy of formation of an item will always have a one here. Yeah. Okay, yes. Oh, okay, also on this. Wait, was this also on this, your question? Oh, no. Uh, I'll do hers first. I, she raised two feet you by mo no, a second. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How did. Oh, whoa. Oh. What? Was that page 31? Okay. Lucky. All right, going back, we did this test as well earlier. Okay, what intermediate were you confused about? Uh-huh. How to do the intermediates? Okay, 
Well, in this case, uh, I multiplied reaction 3 and 4 by 3 halves. So, what does that mean? Well, the liquid will automatically cancel. Because there's three halves in the product and three halves in the reactant, the water liquid. Is that okay? Uh, I multiply by three halves in both cases. So these are both multiplied by three halves. So three halves in the products cancel with three halves in the reactants. Is that kind of okay? And then another intermediate was H2O gas. There's three halves right here. And there was how many here? Anybody? Oh, it was negative one half times three or minus three halves. So I had a minus three halves water here and a plus three halves there. That cancels. Everything will cancel that's an intermediate. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, who's next? Uh, it was the dude where there you are. Yes? Uh, could you do number two on page three? Number two on page three. Uh, Okay, this is spring 12, number, uh, wait, number two, yeah. Okay, this is a Henry's Law question. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, nitrogen gas has a Henry's Law constant equal to 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 molar per atmosphere. Uh, the blah blah blah. The next sentence. Uh, which of the following would be a good substitute for N two uh, in order to make the bends less severe? So basically, we're asking which one would be a good substitute. Uh, well, I guess I'll just show you this. I didn't. I shouldn't have written anything. Uh, so this is a conceptual question. There's no calculation actually necessary. Okay, so if I'm basically just looking for one, something that has a similar number. So there's a couple, like A and C have similar numbers. So that would be a good substitute. Uh, and then I'm looking for something that would make physical sense. So for example, helium's inert, argon's inert, doesn't react. H2, if you read the you flew on the Hindenburg, that explodes. So that's not a good idea to use. CO2, I guess that could be possible. So of the two factors, from the first factor, the number, I was thinking A or C. From the second one, uh, A, helium, is inert. So I think that would be a good choice. And that's it. No special secrets there. Uh, yeah, you should know that uh, the first, all the noble gases, they're not going to react. And you should know things like organics, O2, H2 are potentially combustible or uh, can undergo severe reactions. Okay, who's next? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, he's there. Uh, we want to, oh, okay. This problem here is with mercury. I think this is, this is a mastering chemistry problem. It's also number 92, page, chapter 12. Uh, we have uh, mercury, uh, where are we starting? Mercury solid, and that's, uh, and we're starting at negative 52, and your problem might be a little different depending on how the numbers are randomized. And then we want to warm this up to mercury uh, at 25 degrees, which uh, that would be a liquid. Well, this has to go through a phase change, and the phase change or the melting point is minus 38.87. So all these numbers are given in the question. I also know the delta H of fusion is uh, 2.33 uh, kilojoules per mole. And I also know that uh, the CP for mercury as a solid, so I'll put S for mercury solid, 
is 24.3 joules per mole Kelvin. Here, look, they put a per Kelvin here. Doesn't matter. Same as Celsius. And in, in this kind of CP per, per problem, and this is usually per gram, but here they put it per mole. And you probably also need the CP for the liquid, which is why it refers you to the appendix, unless that's here secretly somewhere. So, uh, yeah, so you need this number. Look this up. You need that number to solve the problem. And uh, what else do we got? Uh, it says that there's a total of 17 grams of the mercury. All right. So how do we set this up? That all information is given. Uh, all you do is say, well, what cues are available here? Maybe I'll just show it on our diagram. There's a cue for, I'll just call it Q1, for heating the solid from minus 52 to minus 38, up to the melting point. And then there's a Q, I'll just call it Q2, for melting it. So a phase change will have a Q. And then there's a Q for heating up the water till the final temperature. So there's three Qs involved. So let's, what you want, the answer is the sum of these three Qs. So I'll show you how to find the Qs and you just add them up. Q1, that's a temperature change. So that's M, C, P, delta T. M is 17. Uh, CP for the solid is 24.3 joules per mole Kelvin. The temperature change is the final minus 38.87 minus the initial negative 52. What, what else do I have to do here? Uh, I don't have to worry about the Kelvin because this is a temperature difference, but I do have to worry about the gram per mole. So one more, I would have to multiply uh, by the molar mass of mercury, look that up in the periodic table. Oh, let me move this up. That is 200.59 or 200.6 grams per mole just to convert those units. That's Q1 only. Let's do Q2. Uh, let's do Q3. I think that'll be easier. Q3, that's heating up the liquid. Q3. Also, MCP delta T, because it includes a temperature change. That would be 17 grams. Oh, oh somebody looked it up. Uh, let me write it down. This is 28.0. What unit? Joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, good. We have that number. So, that because that's per mole, let's just do the conversion now. Uh, 200.6 grams per mole. And now, the number that we looked up, 28.0 joules per mole Kelvin. And then, uh, et cetera, my page is not long enough. Final minus initial. The final temperature was 25 degrees C. The initial temperature is negative 38.87. Again, I don't need to change the Kelvin because it's a temperature difference. It all it washes out. That's Q3. Now, Q2 is the last one. Remember, we're going to add these three numbers up. Uh, Q2. Well, this is a phase change, so now I'm going to use something like this. Uh, the moles. I don't have the moles. Again, annoying. I should have just done it once at the beginning. Moles. Okay, delta H of fusion given was 2.33 kilojoules per mole. So you'll see the moles cancel, but notice that Q1 and Q2 are in units of joules. This, which is normal, they'll give it in kilojoules. So I want to do one more conversion to get this into joules. Get rid of the kilo. Uh, and let's just think about this. Right now, I have this as a positive number. We should double check that. If I'm melting something, am I putting in heat or taking out heat? Putting in. Does that mean it's positive or negative? Positive. So this is correct. It should be a positive number. All right. Add those three numbers up. Do that. Okay. Who's next? 
Uh, that could be, uh, I don't think it's always the oxide. Uh, I guess I'd have to look that up. He's asking what would it really be just mercury by itself. If it wasn't, that would be a major problem. I don't think, uh, outside of knowing Q of reaction to convert that, we wouldn't be able to do that problem. Oh, is mercury? I don't think mercury always has to be oxide, but in this problem it wasn't. So that might have been a different one. Uh, if you happen to have it, we can take a look at it. Uh, but uh, this one we just do like this. Okay, who's next? Yes. 14. 40. Page 40. 40. Page 14. Okay. No, wait. No. Page 40, number 14 in the practice exam reader. Okay, now I got it all straight. And this has a given reaction. 2A gas goes to 3B gas. The enthalpy is minus 0.08206 kilojoules. What quantity of heat is liberated by the reaction if there's 100 liters of A and it had 2280 uh, millimeters of mercury and the temperature was 27 degrees C. Okay, I want to know uh, what's enthalpy for that. Well, from here we know a couple things. So let's go down before I do any big math. I know that delta H, I can write it like this, negative. Kilojoules. This means, and because I care about A in the question, for every two moles of A. If I cared about B, I could put for every three moles of B down here. Okay? So we know that. Now, if it said, oh, there's two moles of A, instead of, instead of saying all this garbage, if it said it's just two moles of A, this would be my answer. But it's not two moles of A, it's this much A. So we need to use this to calculate the moles of A. Notice that this is volume, this is pressure, this is temperature, and he's the ideal gas bond. Yeah. So I need to convert this to Kelvin. That's 300 Kelvin, I believe. I need to convert this to atmosphere. So 2280 millimeters of mercury. Uh, there's 760 millimeters of mercury. And this is converted and given on the test for every one atmosphere. Uh, what does that turn out to be? Oh, awesome. Looks like three. So, uh, moles is PV over RT, is an ideal gas law. P, again, is three atmospheres. V is 100. Uh, R, 0 0.08206. And T is 300. Oh, it looks like uh, 3 times 100 will be 300. Oh, perfect. This will turn out to be um, uh, 1 over 0 0.08206 moles. And then I need to, let's go to the next page. Now I go back to my delta H, negative 0 0.08206. Uh, that's kilojoules uh, per two moles of A. Multiply what I knew now by the known moles. Well, I have 1 over 0 0.08206 moles. Oh, perfect. Somebody must have designed this problem. That cancels, and it's going to be uh, really a half. Minus one half. Since the question said uh, how much is liberated by, uh, it's just reporting the answers as positive, so it's A. Okay, good. Okay, who's next? <laughs>
Yes. I have a question. Can we finish going over the items on chapter 13? Pick one. Yes. Uh, I don't know where it is. Do you remember what it was? Solubility. Which one do you want to do? We'll just take turns. If nobody else has a question, you can do that one too. Uh, actually, I Either. Henry's Law. Uh, let's just start with that one then. Maybe I could do both of them pretty fast. This is this. Uh, or we could solve with a constant. It's C over P. And you could say this is state one and state two. Uh, C of P is the pressure of the gas in a liquid. So this is a gas in a liquid. Okay, C is the solubility or concentration of the gas in the liquid. And P is the pressure uh, exerted to get that in the liquid. And we'll actually do an example in lecture next time. And K is just a constant. Like in the liquid, like soda. Like soda would be a typical life example, yes. So uh, there's two ways that this kind of question can come. Either they give you two, look at the top equation, two of the three variables and you calculate the third, or you're given two different states or three of the four variables here and you calculate the fourth. So it's really a plug and chug sort of question. Okay, so yeah. C solubility is pressure and K is uh, Henry's constant. Yes, C solubility or concentration. K is the Henry's law constant, and P is the pressure applied for the gas. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to feel like a plug and chug, and we'll actually do this top one in lecture next time. Yeah. Uh, the other one was oh, cool solubility. Uh, it's just, I just mentioned it uh, in the last lecture. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. That if you plot solubility versus temperature, the solubility goes up with temperature. For, uh, for really a solid in a liquid, or that is a salt in a liquid, uh, except that. And yeah, uh, oh yeah, let me say something before I say that. Uh, there are a couple exceptions to this, but for most solids, it will go up. For a gas, though, as he was mentioning, if you have a gas in a liquid, uh, then as temperature increases, uh, the solubility will decrease. So this is the opposite. Solid in a liquid is opposite of a gas in a liquid. Oh, oh yeah, that's awkward. Okay, there you go. Is that cool? That was going pretty fast, actually. Good. What are the units of solubility? What are the units of solubility? That's a pretty annoying thing. Uh, you'll see in the in, in different places, depending on where you're looking. There's different units of solubility uh, that are given. Uh, but what I had you do in the very beginning of the chapter, uh, unfortunately, uh, the book defines it a little bit later, but I just define it at the very beginning. This is page 34, my reader. Just as uh, usually it's grams of solute on the top. And then the bottom is a little messy, the numerator. But typically, it's mass or volume of the solvent. But that could vary widely. But those are the typical units of solubility. Okay. Uh, I'll take one last question. Yes, you haven't asked a question yet. Oh. Path and, okay, so this will have to be our last topic. Path dependence or path independence. This is really purely conceptual. For us, there's, there's going to be no math that I can think of. Uh, so what you would do here, let's do it on this slide here. OK, there's path dependent and path independent. 
So I'll first know the definition. Path dependent, it depends the path on which you're going, and that will change the value of the variable. So for example, Q and W are common ones we would think of here, uh, because if you push something directly from one place to another, that's a minimum amount of work you would do. But if you push it in an odd pattern, then uh, the work would change. So that definitely depends on the path. Path independent uh, sort of functions or state functions. Uh, examples of that would be like temperature, uh, any of the thermodynamic values, U is one example. Those would be path independent. And from this, actually, is where we derived, uh, where we said that, oh, delta U is QV, and uh, where delta U is also QP, is this still on the screen? Oh, there we go. Plus W. And we set these two equal to each other to write a variant of the first law that looked like this. So we got that from the path dependent independent thing. Uh, so yeah, you need to know the first law, but these for us tend to be just conceptual. Yeah. If volume doesn't change, delta U equals delta H, and in our world, so I'm just repeating what he said, yes, that's true. In our world, that's almost always true, or nearly true. The delta U and delta H are usually the same. Okay, I think I'll pause right there. If you really have a burning question, come on up. Otherwise, I'll see you in lecture on Tuesday.